so much for coming out on this horrendous night, and maybe someday the winter will end. But what better subject do we have than hot coffee? So, um, before I introduce Evelyn Young, who has gotten our guest for tonight, our, spe our guest speaker for tonight, I just wanted to say that somewhere in the audience is, um, it's a loose leaf binder that I had started I talked about last time. You have it. Okay. Um, just, okay. It's just some of the research I found on the names of a few of the squirrel hull straits. And um, if anybody brings in, um, you don't have to write something because what I found was that as I was researching, I, I found something from one book and something from another book. And instead of trying to put it all in one stor story, I just started to take the different things I found and put them in a section for that street. And we'll just build on that. So if anybody is interested in researching the street and wants to add to our booklet, um, just feel free anytime. You can submit it to me online. I'm Helen Wilson. And just send it to, go to the History at Squirrel Hill website. Um, and I think that's all I needed to say. And Evelyn, right here. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. You're welcome. I think there's a few um, business items I'd like to bring up. We have um, a nice um, uh, outline of um, speakers for the next couple months. In uh, March, we have the history of life. David Durkin is going to be talking to us. In April, we have uh, Michael Walters, who will be speaking to us about the nationality room at the University of Pittsburgh. In May, we have the history of Randall Toy Store, who we all love and been to for our children as well as our grandchildren. Jack Cohen, who's the owner, will be speaking to us. And in June, we have the Civil War in Pennsylvania, stories through photography, and our speaker is Michael Krause. So if you're interested in coming, um, go ahead and uh, look us up on our website, which is www.squirrelhillhistory.org. If you'd like to receive our email, I'll stop at the back later on and make sure that we have your email address and we, and Helen will make sure you get an email from us when it's time for those lectures and updates. Um, okay, and our, all our lectures are free and everybody's welcome to come. Anyone who's interested in becoming a member, please stop at the back and um, sign up to be a member. Um, is there anything else I might have missed for you to include? Patty, Ralph, Helen? No? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, on to our speaker. It's been 20, it was 21 years ago when Squirrel Hill um, Coffee Tree opened up on Forbes Avenue. <coughs> and it was the first roaster that we had in our community. Those of us who lived nearby could smell the wonderful aroma as we wake up in the morning as Bill was roasting his coffee. Since then, Bill's business has grown, and he's expanded to, from one store to six stores in that time, and he no longer roasts his coffee in our neighborhood, so we don't get that wonderful aroma. He does it at his warehouse. But not only that, his business expanded, so has his family. He was a family of one, and now he's a family of four, and he now resides in our wonderful neighborhood. So please welcome my good friend, Bill Street. slides for us here. We're going to start with some very easy stuff. Um, yeah, it's hard to believe 20 years. I mean, it's amazing. My father and I opened this together, this store, and he is still my partner. He still works more hours a week than I do. He works seven days a week because that's what he likes to do. Um, just to give you a general background, the first question everybody always asks me is what made you think we'll do the coffee shop, sort of before there were coffee shops around. Um, I had graduated Penn State. My first job took me to Boston, and that, that was great. I, I drank bad coffee there uh, because I needed it to learn how to get up and make it to work on time. But, and I was actually in the toy business. I sold toys. I met a girl, went to see her in Portland, Maine, and she took me to a coffee house on Saturday morning. And this place was hopping. There were people everywhere, and it was in the center of Portland, Maine. It faced a big park. There were people outside, and there were two things going on. Everybody was obviously excited with all the caffeine, but also they had a roaster going. 
And I'm nothing more than a big gadget guy, so I was just mesmerized by this machine. And I'm thinking, I could do this in Pittsburgh. Okay. That evening I called my father and said, we could do this in Pittsburgh. That was about March of 1991. Took me a, a year to do some research, figure it out, and quit my job and move back to Pittsburgh. So I moved back in January of 92. And we started looking for a location. This is going to be easy. So, believe it or not, by July of 92, we had two locations lined up. And both of them happened to be in Swickley. And we were like ready to sign the deal, and both of the landlords backed out on us at the last minute. So we went back to scratch uh, immediately. And so by the fall of 92, we had no locations and no prospects, anything. And that's when I found uh, the first location. This is going to be the store as it opened. Go ahead. And it's a little dark. I'm sorry. It's before good digital cameras. Um, this is how the store looked when it opened in July 3rd, 1993. Go on to the next one. Uh, this is the inside that Christmas. Just the various pictures. Go ahead. Go on, skip through. You can see the roaster right in the front of the store at that time. We used to pump a lot of smoke on the street. So I would roast from about 3 o'clock in the morning until about 6 when we finished. So that we weren't putting too much smoke out when everybody was up and around. Okay? Go oh, one more there. That's the roaster. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I still have that roaster and I still use it every day. We just moved it into our warehouse. And it's our great little small roaster and it's 20 years old now. One more. That's the store we took over. Waldorf Specialty Foods. Everybody remembers the original Waldorf Bakery. It was around the corner on Murray. They got bought. They moved the main baking location actually down to Regent Square. This was a retail store. And we had walked in that store, and this is just one of those things by luck, and we walked in and it was very obvious that they were not going to be in business for very long. So we talked to them and we said, you know, we're interested in getting you out of your lease. Trying to be nicely and say, because you guys are dying on the vine. And they said, sure, give us $80,000. Well, since that was more than our budget for the entire thing, my father and I said, I, th I don't think so. We'll, we'll call you when you close and we'll see what we can do. So we turned around and immediately called the landlord and said, by the way, this guy's going out of business. When you're ready, give us a call. Go ahead and flip in there. So by January, they were gone. And this is what the inside of the store looked like. Um, these lights up here, you could get a suntan in there. So, so bright. Um, you notice the door was on the other side of the window. The window was actually tinted and you couldn't see it. It looked closed all the time. And the door was recessed into kind of a hole. So go back to the front. If you can go back one there. The one, uh, this store is only about 1170 on the first floor. Um, but it has a complete, very, very nice basement. Turn left there. And do the, just do that again. Okay, so this store, the wood was T111 sign, you see the door was there. We decided that the one thing we had to do was totally rip the front off. I'll just jump back one more. Anyway, yeah. I gotta get one of those things. I don't know how to work on it, but I gotta get one of those things. Oh. I went like too far back. Huh? Yeah. There you go. So the first thing we knew we had to do is make the store look a little nicer than that. So we hired a squirrel hole architect, uh, Steve Hawkins, uh, did the work for us. Okay, go ahead. All right. So then the store, the front of the store has been remodeled twice. You can see in the early years we added the uh, we added the awning and the outside chairs. You see, you can see the roaster is still in there, and then about. Four or five years ago, we did this outside remodel, which is nice because the whole front opens up now. So it makes it feel open air even when it's raining out. And that's been a big, a big thing for us. Okay. This was my second store. Uh, opened October 30th, 1994. This is the Fox Chapel Plaza. Go on one more click there. This is what it looked like before. It was actually a very nice little store. But, okay. This is my Mount Lebanon store. Once again, these are before the good digital cameras, so I apologize. I'm not, I'm not a great photographer. Um, this is on Beverly Road. You asked the question before. It's about 1,300 square feet. Okay. And it also has a nice basement. Uh, 
I apologize. There's some better pictures of Shady Side coming. This is the Shady Side store, which is 2003. Um, this store is 3,200 square feet. It's very large for a coffee house. We did realize early on that Shady Side area was going to have a lot more people kind of hanging out. If you try to go in there, you'll see on a Saturday, there's a lot of people with a computer and sit there for quite a bit. We, needed, we knew we needed that extra seating space. But this was the first store we were able to do, soft seats, the fireplace in it. It is a, a multi-level store, so it, it kind of has some different comfort areas in it. And it, actually, it has a, uh, what we call a library in the back that we reserve space for. And people can have meetings, etc. I've had a baby shower in there. Have you? In, in, in your store in the back upstairs? Yeah. That, that private room? That private room? Yeah, we call it the library. During study season, it is... It's a student's hangout, and it's very, we don't make any comments about it, but it's so self-policed. If you're in there and your phone rings, you get the eye. You, know? <laughs> you get the eye. You've got to, you know, it's a study. You just hurry up, run out, and, and it's been a great space for us. Um, now, the whole front's a garage door. This is what the old front was. This was the listing post and the national record mark. We had to take a steel beam out and move it up about five feet to just open the store up. We wanted air, and we wanted room in it. This is the Bakery Square store that opened in 2010. Um, there's no pre-picture on it because it was brand new construction. It has three of the garage doors. It's right there. There's a couple more pictures of that next, I think. That's the, the side that faces Penn. is actually the back of the store. It has those graphics. I love this espresso machine with the flames. I couldn't help but put that in it. That's one of my favorite things. Then this is our newest store. This is in the Bill Green Shopping Center in Pleasant Hills. Uh, it's a little strip mall, very cute little store, and, and uh, it also has the storefront opening window. So that's the six stores that we have now. Okay. Uh, this is what that store had to look like before. I was like the before and after. All right, we'll just leave it there for a bit. So uh, we started as a roaster, which means we purchased green coffee through brokers, especially when we were small, from around the world bring in the raw coffee, roast it in our own store, it's our specifications, so it's as fresh as we can make it. Um, even to this day, we've always had the same thing. All our coffee in our store has an eight-day rotation. So that means if we roast coffee on Tuesday, that store has to sell it or serve it by Wednesday the next week, by the end of the day Wednesday. And that's something we really stick on. It's one of our manager's accountabilities, uh, and they stick to it. So you're always going to get coffee that's less than a week. And there's a big difference. Really, coffee is fresh for about four weeks, but we figure if we serve it in a week, you've got a good three weeks to use it before you're going to have any problems and enjoy it. Okay? Now, this picture on the left is my father, for those of you who may see him around when he was there. I'm referred to as Bill Jr., he's Bill Sr., or the Bills, or whatever. We answer to pretty much anything. Um, that is one of our early trips to, to Costa Rica. We're actually picking coffee. Um, I will say that in all my trips, I'm the... I'm the uh, I've never been beaten. I can pick more than anybody else. But I can tell you I can pick nowhere near as much as a picker can pick. They know what they're doing. It's uh, dirty, hard work. We'll show some more pictures here as we go. That's actually, believe it or not, a recent picture of me being silly. But what I'm showing you here is the way the coffee plant starts. It, it is a ever, natural evergreen. It's a tropical plant. It is indigenous to Africa. It is not from anywhere else. It was transplanted to everywhere else in the world. It's from Eastern Africa and, the Yemen, and Yemen, the, or the peninsula. But it starts as a little seed, and you see the first thing it does, it grows a taproot. Uh, very important thing about that is when it's planted, it has to be planted with a deep hole underneath it. As soon as the taproot comes down and hits something, it'll stop growing, the tree will die. Okay? You see that, whoop, go back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> The, the left one is, is uh, that's gone a little bit farther. It first develops two round leaves. It's the only round leaves it will have. And you see the taproot continues. And these are all grown. Most farms grow only with their own stock because they don't want to change what their coffee is. Okay, go ahead. This is a nursery. This one happens to be in Antigua, part of Guatemala. You see all the small plants, the little black bags? They're round cylinders. It has to give room for the taproot to grow. And the taproot is basically as deep as the tall the tree is tall. 
and it has to, like I said, straight down. They, the trees will spend about 18 months in a, a nursery like this, partially shaded, watered, taken care of very, very well, and actually pruned and weeded the whole time. Go ahead. This is a, uh, another terraced um, nursery. These are all little trees. In this particular field, there's about 150,000 nursery trees. <coughs> this, field, this particular farm is in Costa Rica. It has about a million and a half trees and it replaces 10% of its trees every year. All right, we'll, we'll go through that in a little bit of information on that in a minute. Go ahead. And this is in Costa, the highlands of Costa Rica. It's a coffee we sell called Lamanita. And it's a particular estate, a particular farm. This is a yearling. This is about the 18-month-old one that's finally been put into a place in the, in the ground. You can see it looks kind of natural. It's, it's been in a little bit. They dig a hole typically as deep as four feet, and they layer it with natural fertilizer and compost from the farm. They don't want anything they don't have to get from outside. And they want that hole nice and soft so that taproot can grow straight. Once again, the bends it's done. So the first year of the tree, now it's 18 months and into year one in the field, it produces nothing. It doesn't produce a single leaf. Okay, go ahead. Um, this is just a picture I threw in because I love this farm. Uh, these are all coffee trees mixed underneath shade trees. Go ahead. Tree, uh, they are evergreens, but they grow uh, very sporadically on a yearly basis. They actually grow on a, almost a biannual basis. One year they'll grow and produce a big crop, the next year they'll produce a small crop. And it has a lot to do with what they call stress on the tree. You need, for a coffee tree to grow well, it has to have a defined rainy period, as in the tropics, rains every afternoon during the rainy period, and then a good dry period. Because what happens is a good dry period, the tree, the, the tree will shuttle, it'll break down, it'll sort of shelter in, it'll wilt, it'll look like really bad, it'll look like a dirty farm. But what happens then, when the rain comes, it's like, hey, we've been stressed, it's time to grow. And you can see here, all this green is new growth. So it's grown at least six to eight inches this year above. The other thing that's important for new growth like that is coffee cherries only develop on the new growth. They don't really develop on the old wood. So you might get, you see a little bit one back where my finger is, but back before I'm that, you'll get no more cherries that year from that tree. Okay? It starts as a flower. It's a self-pollinating flower. And what typically, ha typically happens is after five good solid days of rain in May, in Costa Rica, it's usually May, you'll have the flower. Now, the flowering will look like it's snow. The whole tree will be covered in these small white flowers like this. Very nice little honeysuckle smell. It can be very sweet. Um, but it's self-pollinated because there's no way anything can pollinate that many flowers. These flowers only remain on the trees for about three to four days. Then boom, the rain knocks them off and they're gone. Now what I want to show you is the trees may flower several times during the time period, especially if they get a weird dry thing. If you look back at these ones back here, those are called pinheads. There where a flower was and already fell off, each one of those pinheads will become a coffee cherry. So this is what coffee cherries look like in the wild. Uh, you can see the red, red, ripe ones. The green ones are immature, so not ready. Go ahead. These are in a variety that happens to be yellow. Just threw it in for a variety. But you can tell they're a nice ripe yellow right there. Go ahead. Pickers. I can tell from, from my little experience of picking, it's one of the worst jobs in the world. It's very intense. It's very intense. Women are much better at it than men, for some reason. You literally are in a tree that's taller than you, and you have to pick only the red, red cherries. She's not allowed to pick the green cherries. She won't get paid for those. Uh, if she picks too many, you can actually get fired from the job. But it is actually a very good job during that time of year. The problem is it's only seasonal work. So, you know, this young lady's, but go ahead on to another one. Um, everybody heard about Brazil? Brazil is the only country that really uses mechanical harvesting. Um, you see their trees are about 10 feet tall. The reason for that is all of Brazil's plantings are on mesas. So the top of a mountain, but it's completely flat. And they plant these huge, huge crop circles, and they can do this because it is flat. 
Brazil is the number one coffee producing country in the world at about 33% of the world market right now. Right? Number two is Vietnam. Number three used to be Colombia. I'm not even sure who it is. Colombia has really had some troubles the last couple of years with uh, crops with sizes. Um, so it's, it's slipped from them a bit. No, one more is another picture of the harvesting. So these, it's basically log sticks that just beat the tree. One of the things I want you to notice is see all the green mixed in? Unfortunately, when you don't pick by hand, you get a lot of green coffee beans mixed in with your pickings. Okay? That young lady that we saw picking before, what they'll do prior to, to do it is they have to sort the green coffee out. As long as they sort it out, they'll get paid for everything. But you can't have a mix. Very important, the biggest defect in coffee, what I consider a defect, the biggest off flavor from good coffee to bad coffee, is when unripe coffee gets mixed through the entire system. You can't, there's no way to separate, out, separate it out after this point. So that's why they're required to do that, to sort them before they turn them in for purchase. They do get paid on the green if it's sorted out. I sort of said that wrong before. So as they're going through their bags, and this may be what they picked for a day, these plastic bags behind them, and they're at what's called a paying station waiting to get paid. This also happens to be Costa Rica. Okay. So a coffee cherry has two, two seeds in it, and they develop next to each other, and that's why they're flat side to side. Um, if anybody goes to my stores, you ever see a pea berry? Ever hear of a pea berry? A pea berry is when one side just sort of doesn't develop, so it's not there pressing against its partner, so this one comes out round. The theory is that because only one seed is developed by all the energy of, this, of the fruit, it's going to be sweeter. Eh, I don't know. It's good, but I don't know if it's that much sweeter. So this is from the cherry. There's a very little skinny fruit on it, but the fruit is really stuck to the seed. If you were to taste it, it's very sweet. Okay? This is a nice picking from a farmer of a bunch of ripe cherries. They really have that great red, red flavor, or color. Right. It's another picker. And he's just filling back. Okay, this is a paying station. This is something I always like. This is a very exciting time for people up here. When they're getting paid, they're just turning in the coffee they pick. There's an area that they're assigned to pick. There's bosses. Not even, I've never seen anybody yelling at anybody saying, here's where you go pick today. Here's where you pick. And they'll pick, and then they know they pick generally from 6 till about 2, and they get paid at 3. Very important thing in Costa Rica and most coffee producing countries, to prevent abuses, it's the law. They get paid that day. They get paid in cash for what they pick that day. A lot of these guys are immigrant workers. In Costa Rica, you have a, really what's an emerging economy. So while you have Costa Rican pickers, the bulk of the pickers are made up by Nicaraguan migrant workers and Panamanian Indians that come up to pick to make good money during that season before they go, they'll go back home. One of the interesting things is that a farm like this has a relationship with a Panamanian clan, let's say. It's an Indian tribe, clan, whatever you call it. They're required to go send a bus for them. The clan leader and brings his guys, they come up, and then when they're done, they're required to take them back. And it's in Costa Rica, it's, it's a fairly established law. It's not something you want to mess with. Um, if the clan leader gets pissed off because you're not treating him well, he'll take his whole group and leave. Now, a farm like this, this is about, let's say it's 1,500 acres. Probably 1,100 acres are in production. They'll have 400 to 500 migrant workers picking at that time of the year. And picking in Costa Rica starts in December and is finishing right now here in, in the beginning half of February. Okay? So everybody is paid by this thing, this little box here. So all the coffee you pick, they dump it into these boxes. It's called a cojela. It's a certain size. Every year the government comes out, measures it to make sure you didn't change the size of it, and, and puts a seal on it. So you can't chip anybody. That's the whole thing, which is, which is okay. And you get paid by the coin. The amount you get paid actually rotates through the year. So the beginning of the year when there's not as many ripe, and it's more difficult picking because you can only get the ripes and leave the greens, they pay more. In the heart of the season when you can get the most, they pay a little bit less. Then it goes back higher at the end of the year, too. So it kind of balances out a little bit. Um, the, the thing that is important here is that, and I, I don't know what their um, 
regular average income is, they can be making as much as twenty to thirty dollars a day. Now to us that's nothing, but to them that's a heck of a lot of money that time of year. And that's why they'll work so hard. They work five and a half days a week, so they work half a day on Saturday. If the crop is in, they'll work Sundays too. But generally they have Sundays off. But it's amazing to me that millions and millions of pounds of coffee that come out of Costa Rica is all measured one coil at a time. <coughs> Seems a little... so. The coffee is, as you can see right here, you see the guy holding the cash right there in the back corner? As they weigh your coffee in, they call it out, there's the cash box, they pay you right then for it. It's very interesting. You know, there's a lot of anti-child labor laws, but young teens do pick, and they get their money. And in Costa Rica in particular, they get to keep their own money. It doesn't generally go into a family, a family thing. Um, but they'll pay as they go, and they'll pay the whole family. Everybody then takes off and goes, goes home for the night. See them again tomorrow morning at the gathering spot. Go ahead. So all that coffee goes into a truck. That's from different parts of the farm, and this is called a receivador. No, one more, I think, is the right thing I want to show. This is called a medida. A medida is 20 coelos. coelos. Um, the thing about the medida is they measure all that coffee again. Because they want to make sure that the guy that was giving out the money gave out the right amount of money for the right amount of coffee he got. So that it's a double check system. And they'll count it all as it gets dumped into that hopper. They'll count it. They close it, dump it, and they'll do this for tractor trailers full of trucks. And it's amazing how fast they can actually do it. Go ahead. It goes into a water holding tank. The uh, thing I like about this is it, this is the, the first separation here. What it does is all the good dense cherries sink straight to the bottom, including, unfortunately, the ripe green, the unripe greens would sink too. So we don't want any of those in here. You always see some; those may be yellow. What's on the top are floaters. They're usually defective coffee beans or overripes. So we can separate the first bad quality off. And everything in coffee works in three qualities. First quality, second quality, thirds. These floaters, straight to the end of the line, thirds. Okay? Go ahead. The next thing is they go through a series of the pulpers. You can see them right around here. They do what essentially you saw in my hand with the, chair, the beans being squeezed out. They pop the fruit. Now, the first set of the pulpers only are set very nice and wide. So they're only popping the nice, big, rich, ripe fruit. If anything doesn't get pulped, all right, go to the next one, it's separated out here. These are called caribs. So you see the thin things? The beans, the good ones that are pulped, will slide through those and come out. The ones that didn't get pulped will stay in, and they'll rotate to the other end. And the first ones that came out are first, the second ones are seconds. Right? So the ones that continue through are seconds. Essentially goes to a second set of pulpers, does the same thing, another set of creeps. What comes out through the slots of creeps is the seconds. Anything goes through, now we're back to third. Those all go down to thirds. So that's how coffee is sorted in threes most of the time. Go ahead. This is the set of the second one. Just looking how as they spin and the coffee's flowing into it from the left and through the side, <coughs> popping out. <coughs> then what happens is the coffee, as you can see, it's mostly it's got some fruit left in it. It hasn't been washed yet. But it's going into a fermentation tank. This is wet process coffee fermentation. This is usually the best stuff. Okay? What they do is they'll put it in these tanks. Now remember we're in the tropics. And that fruit is really stuck on the outside of the chair, of the, of the seed. To get it off, you have to ferment it and basically let it break down a little bit. This will sit in this tank for about 18 hours. This has all happened to this point within eight hours of picking. Sometime from it got turned in at three o'clock till midnight or so, they'll be done pick they'll be done getting this in and getting it into the fermentation tanks. Okay? This is a washing channel. Washing channels I've never seen to catch them running, I don't know why. So after it's fermented, there's somebody who makes a decision and said, okay, this is ready. And you can kind of do it by the feel. I've I've been told what's right. I'm not sure I'm smart enough to do it for a living, but and it's usually some old guy who knows everything. And know he's been around forever, he's been there since he was a kid. So they'll run the coffee using water density sorting again. They'll run it down. You see these paddles sticking up. The paddles are coming backwards. 
and they're creating an agitation and they're knocking all that fermented fruit off the seed. And the other thing that happens by this is a density sort. All the lighter weight beans, they fly down the channel. The heavier, denser, better quality stay at the end. So once they, they'll do it and they'll run it and keep beating it back and then they'll say, okay, everything's clean enough. They'll reverse the motor and start taking it down. The first group that comes off is third qualities. The second group that come off is second qualities, and the good stuff is the last one that comes off, the heaviest, densest, densest beans. And they'll separate them down at the bottom. Go ahead. Then they'll, what they do, the next step is dry. So there's a couple of ways they do that. Uh, the most common way are these great big dryers. Essentially, they'll dump this coffee into a holding tank, they'll let it drip dry for maybe 24 hours, then they'll put it into this. It's really just like your dryer at home, except very slow moving, just turns the coffee slowly, and it only uses about maybe 110 to 125 degrees temperature. You don't want to dry it too quickly, you'll crystallize the sugars inside and the coffee will taste different. The other thing they do in some places is, is sun dry. This gentleman's walking on a big pile of coffee that's sun dry. I purchased a coffee uh, called Lamanita Sun Dry, which is exactly this picture is from Almanita, so that's partially my coffee there. They, it takes nine days to dry on the patio. It takes about 24 to 36 hours to dry in the dryer. So I pay a lot extra for that manpower. Every night they have to rake that ballot up and put it in a pile so it doesn't get rained up. Or moisture or dew. Um, I'm one of three roasters in the world that buy this particular coffee because I think it is something special to be done the old way and to be hand dried rather than roasted than, than dried in, in, the, in the mechanical dryer. Go ahead. Uh, this, this happens to be a picture of me just checking out my coffee. <laughs> so these are the mechanical dryers. You can see them in here. The things They just dump it out. This coffee is still in a parchment skin. Uh, I don't know how to describe parchment except that it's a little, it's a thicker skin and as the coffee bean inside has dried, it's kind of loose in there. And it doesn't fill the whole volume of the parchment skin as the moisture was put out during drying. It goes from here into rest. They'll want this coffee to sit for about at least 30 days. More likely, they'd like to get closer to 60 if they have the room to just let the coffee rest and neutralize. As you're drying it, it's not a perfect system. But if you can get it into a good uh, container, a good silo, the best qualities go into wood line silos, the cheaper qualities go into metal silos, it'll kind of balance out the coffee moisture content through everything. And moisture content is what we look for freshness. If it's too dry, it's probably old. If it's too wet, it's not going to taste good and it's going to go bad really quickly. So we're looking for moisture content is what it's all about here. Go ahead. Then it's, when they've decided it's rested enough, they hull it. So you can see how it's starting to look green, and you see how the dust of the skin's coming off. And they put through these round things that have holes in them specific sizes that grades the beans by size. That's where the pea berries get pulled out separately because they fall through the smaller holes, all the way up to the bigger sizes. Now, an important thing that people ask me about all the time is Colombian Supremo. What does that mean? Well, Supremo doesn't really mean anything. There's really two sizes of Colombian coffee is Supremo and Excelso. Supremo is a bigger bean. It's a certain percentage over a certain size number, whatever. The Excelsos have some of that, but also smaller mixed in. The reason you do that is because when you roast, the reason you sort by size is when you roast, if you have small beans and big beans, they don't roast at the same rate. So when you roast it, you end up with these that are all cooked and overcooked and these that are underdone. So they want to grade it by size to make it a better roasting coffee. Everybody thinks Supremo is great. It, it, it isn't necessarily the best. Just because it's Supremo, it could be really bad. But an Excelso from the same place can taste better. I tend to like the Excelsos. They tend to be a more interesting flavor to me. <coughs> so uh, the big strawberries sometimes aren't the best. The little ones are better. It's the same thing. Okay. Here's an interesting thing here is that how technology has affected it. These are color eye sorters, and they shoot beans past these little electronic eyes that look for color defects at an amazing rate. I don't know how many thousands go through a minute, but thousands of beans, one at a time, are shot through each one of those heads. And what happens is it's shooting through, 
if the electronic eye sees an off color, and they've gotten more and more sophisticated, it uses a pinch of air, a little burst of air, goes boop, and it knocks that one out of the line. So that's a color sort to get any black beans, off color beans, sorted out of the process very easily and mechanic this way. But, go to the next one. The best quality beans are hand sorted. The human eye is still far, far superior. Um, this looks like a bad job, but down there it's a really a good job. It's not as dirty as picking. You make a lot of money. One of the things that's interesting, I, I learned this this year, if you look and you check out, the women are much better at it. There are a couple of men, but not many. You see two women. You see young women and older women. What happens is these girls get out of high school, very high graduation literacy rate in Costa Rica, uh, get out of high school, this is a great job. They only hire people from the local neighborhood. They don't allow uh, other people in because they want to keep the revenue that they pay in the neighborhoods, in the towns. Even when I first started going to this farm, they did this was a few hours away. They would bus girls locally down and back so that they could pay the income into the neighborhoods and the surrounding villages. So anyhow, you see the young girls, and then you see the, the little bit older ladies. What happens in between is these ladies get married and raise a family. And then they're all invited back. They're all offered to come back. It kind of like, once you get in, you have that job and you're ready to come back to the two. And, you know, the, the thing is, you see girls on iPods, the headsets, they're chatting to each other, they're listening to music, the ladies are talking. It's actually a very busy kind of fun place. They are not paid by the pound because they don't want them to rush. They're paid by the hour. They are graded and they're work, they are reviewed a little bit, but uh, they're still paid by the hour, so it's considered fair. Okay. So then what happens is the coffee gets tested. They test it at the farm. If there's an exporter, he'll test it, and I'll get a pre-shipment sample as well. So this green shop coffee will be sent to me in a very small bag. We use these little small roasters. I have one of the same brand at home, only this is a six barrel and I, I don't have six. I don't need six yet. So, go ahead. To, as we know, is coffee. Now, this is the cupping process. We do this in my office. Uh, we do it when we're visiting farms, etc. Go back one sec. Very important thing that we do at the dry stage there is that we weigh out the whole beans first and then we grind each sample separate. The reason we do that is if you ground the whole batch in and weigh it as you go, you might have spread a bad bean across the several cups. So this one bad bean can make this cup taste terrible. So we don't want to let one bean cross it. Now, if I get a sample, and a typical sample size is a minimum of four and more like five cups. So if we get one and out of the five cups, one cup is bad, we'll pull ten more samples. We want to find out if that problem, whatever it is, whether it's an off taste, an unripe beans, black beans, any of that stuff is spread out through the whole sample. And if you get it again, you may say, oh, I still want to try it further, and you may pull 40 samples. Realistically, at that point, you probably say, forget it, I'm done. This sample is not going to pass. We're not going to buy this cough. So they're kept separate right from the very beginning. Go ahead. We pour water and we brew right in the cup, right on the grounds. Go ahead. We sniff the grounds. Once again, we're looking for off flavors. It's a bit of a messy job. You can tell the pours, pours, miss. Right. We break the grounds with a spoon. Once again, we're smelling at this point. It's too hot to taste. There's a five cup sample. When it cools down enough, we'll sip it. Now, it's really a slurp and it's noisy. My wife don't come to cuppings because it's too loud. <laughs> and so it's all those things you don't want your people serving. serving so that's me with hair, by the way. <laughs> and we'll go through and do a tasting. This is a cupping in El Salvador in 2005. Uh, this is a cupping hosted by the country trying to showcase some of their best coffees. I'll show you one of the funny things about it. You see the tape on the windows? We had a hurricane coming the next day. And we had to have a her, her, we had an earthquake that afternoon too. But it was a big nothing. It hit the, it hit the shoreline and then just died. So it was, but I'm sitting there cupping, watching them tape the windows, and I thought, this is really odd. Very surreal. 
So it was, but it was, it was really a great talk. I'll say that much more. Um, we buy in El Salvador right now, called a Maribel Estate. It's very good. Go ahead. Uh, this is a typical round cupping table. I always like these. They're cool. They're not very functional. But once again, this this group's tasting four and just trying to decide what they like. Go ahead. All right. I just threw in some fun pictures. <laughs> this is my brother and I. We were in Colombia and we went on this very long horse ride, and that was my horse. The funny thing about that tongue is it never went back in his mouth. <laughs> it was that way the whole time. I don't know why they gave him to me. Uh, he threw me once. I swear every time I get on a horse I get tossed off or bumped off or scraped off or something. But we had a very long ho uh, horse ride that day and it decided to pour in the middle of it as it does in the tropics. And by the time we got back, I, you know, uh, we were just exhausted and sitting down. But that horse treated me very well. I, I felt bad for its tongue problem, whatever that was. Okay. Uh, cupping. This is a tea garden. I just threw it in because it's the first time I'd ever been in one. Um, it is like a perfect hedge of immense size. There's all kinds of paths through it, but you can't see them from the top. You can feel them with your feet. So I just walked in there and wandered in and was picking some tea. And it, it, it just totally covers you up. And it was one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. This is just another picture of a cupping that I liked. That one was in Burundi. Both of these were in Burundi. Uh, this is Rwanda. Uh, a lot is being done in Rwanda right now. Um, huge coffee initiatives as a way to help that country since its uh, genocide. Now, Burundi was affected by the same genocide. Rwanda, obviously, we know about, was much, much higher profile. Um, people asked me if I felt safe there. I felt very safe. The presence there now is somewhat of a benevolent dictator. Whether he becomes a true dictator or he stays benevolent will yet to be seen. But he made it, personal safety a very high priority. So the punishments, if you violate that, are real high, so they don't violate. Okay? Whether he... He's changed some laws that seem that he wants to be in power for a long time. So whether he's a benevolent dictator or just a plain old dictator will be interesting to find out. We'll know in a few years. Is you talking about? Uh, I think that's his name, yeah. yeah. He's made some laws that allow himself to be reelected to remove term limits, and that's not a good sign, personally. But the country has made great strides, and they put a big focus on their coffee industry. Um, there was a lot of you, American aid that went into it. This picture didn't turn out too good. These are raised drying beds. In Rwanda, instead of having a big 1,500 acre farm, farmers have a little two acre farm. And they have pigs on it. They may be growing cucumbers on it. They may, they're definitely growing corn on it. They definitely probably have a pig or some other subsistence type things and definitely a couple of goats. So they're just picking cherry and they get, you know, 10 or 15 pounds. And they take it to the washing station and sell it to the washing station. But they might do that every week during the picking season. So they're just doing a kind of a subsistence level, like having what you call a garden farm in your back. Um, this was a meeting they set up when I was there with farmers who were trying to figure out what the heck American buyers are thinking. Their first question is, how can you charge so much when you pay so little? Um, you know, it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. They don't understand. Um, that the majority of cost in a cup of coffee is not the coffee. When I sell a cup of coffee to anyone here, and start, whether it's me or Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, our biggest cost is not the coffee. It's the person handing it to you. Over 30% of your cost is tied up in that person handing it to you. Uh, cu cups follow quickly after. Overhead, rent, everything else. Um, you know, the, the cost of the coffee is relatively minor. We throw a lot of coffee away after an hour because we want it to be fresh. Because it's more important, the other aspects are much more important. This I threw in because I love this place. This is the Pyramid of the Sun. I went to Mexico and got to walk up that thing. I didn't think I'd make it. Uh, but I, I did. And uh, that's one of the great things about the coffee business. I love to get to travel a little bit with it. Um, this was last year in Poaz Volcano. It's an active volcano. It's still, you see the smoke coming up. It's not spitting any lava, just it smells like sulfur. I went there this year in, uh, in, in January. I was in, I was in Costa Rica. I was supposed to be glass month, but I'm poor. this trip came up, so I went. Couldn't see a thing. It was too cloudy. Couldn't see a single thing. 
All right, and that's the end of the slides. This is uh, Sunset in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. So somewhere on the other side, there's the Pacific Ocean. But it's okay, that was the main thing I wanted to talk about, and then take any questions from there. Go ahead. Uh, well, you showed the cup with the coffee before you brewed it. How many beans does it take to make that much coffee? To use it That's about 13 grams for that size cup. I, the thing about it is it's really not a set thing. It used to be somebody, Mozart used to say 60 beans. You count out 60 beans with a cup of coffee. Problem was, problem was I don't know how much water you put in. But it is a, a tablespoon for six ounces of water adjusted to taste. Some people like their coffee weaker. Some people like their coffee stronger. There's no set rule. There is, in the industry, there's some rules that we try and go, but it's more like we're aiming for a target range. We're not trying to hit exact one point and say, this is it, forget it. We'll taste it and see how it tastes. There's a Tanzania pea berry that we sell. We add a little extra coffee to that all the time because it just plain tastes better that way. Okay. You know? So the, the, the important things for brewing coffee, cold, fresh water, fresh beans. Everybody hates to hear this, but grind your own. It makes a huge difference, huge difference. And just because of surface area and, uh, and, and staling. And how do you keep the beans for the other eight months when they're not growing? Well, when they're green, coffee will store pretty well. So the, that's the key to a local roaster like us, is that that coffee is relatively fresh. I have some coffees now that are already 10 months old. I can taste the difference. You may or may not be able to. But we want to use everything in what we call, we want to stay within, always within current crop. So I'm still using last year's Lamanita crop because they're just harvesting it now and I won't see my next for another month or two. If I buy a car from Africa, it takes eight weeks to get here, a minimum. If I buy it from Rwanda, it takes 14. Who knows why, it just does, you know, it just does. Go ahead, man. Well, I, this is the first time I've ever heard the word cherries being used with coffee. Right. Um, I, I would like to know what the feel of it would be, but... It's a harder being cherry. It's harder because it's smaller. Oh. The fruit is very thin. When you say fruit, is it similar to the cherries that we eat? Yep, but it's very, like, and so, so if you get a big cherry with a pit in the middle, right? You got like maybe three eighths of an inch of fruit all the way around? Yes. This has less than a sixteenth of fruit all the way around. It's skin, tiny bit of fruit, and all seed. Oh, and So then it's harder. And the seeds inside are eventually what you call the beans? Correct. So at that point, we still call them a seed when it's still alive. Okay. Once we take it and do the drying process particularly, it won't grow anymore. It's too dry. How about the pips that you can see? Coffee trees up uh, there are pips with the cherries on You know what? I forgot about that. Yeah, I have a couple in my office that we try growing. Every once in a while, they don't make it. But we keep trying to grow them every once in a while. Pips um, Conservatory does have a coffee that occasionally, if you haven't seen one and you haven't seen the cherries, that's a good place to go and see them. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry, somebody else. Do you have any of these in your store? No. Like beans, uh, not, like the cherries? Not that's the raw the cherries, no. We, oh. we don't, they don't, they don't grow well here. They're out of their nature. My father, who I said, like I said, he takes care of the coffee trees we do have in our offices, and he's like measures them. He has a mental thing figured out how to make them into a dry season when he waters them a lot less, and what time of the year he waters them more to make it more like a wet season, and tries to take care of them. I don't have the patience for that. He has the green thumb. And one more. Sure. Uh, there are various species of coffee. What yeah. is the what is the difference in species? Um, there's about four different major species, of which two of them are not drinkable, so we'll forget about those. Uh, the two why are they drinkable? They just don't have good flavor. They just uh. don't taste very good. So the two remaining are the ones you hear about, Ar Arabica or Arabica, both are correct. Mm -hmm. And the other one's Robusta. Okay. Oh. Robusta is mostly what, say, Vietnam grows. Very hardy plant, 
grows really well, produces a lot of cherries, a lot of Brazil's Robustas, higher in caffeine, lower in flavor and quality. Arabicas are the ones that grow and grow nicer and they'll grow slower, less yield, but a sweeter cup of coffee. I can get more and more complicated because then you go from high grown to low grown. If you take the same plant and grow it low grown, it'll grow better, it'll grow faster, it'll ripen faster. It won't taste as good as if you do it at high ground where it ripens slower. So you want to have altitude as one of the other major functions that we look at. So if you see coffees that say HG, high ground, or SHG, strictly high ground, those are, mean, those are elevations. And they mean different things in different countries, and it all spreads out relative to the equator. So if you're closer to the equator, you need to be higher up to slow down that process farther away from the equator, you can get a better coffee a little bit lower. We grew up with Colombian coffee with Don Water, whatever his name was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he didn't mention anything about Colombian coffee. Yeah, the only thing I said uh, in, in the beginning is Colombia for a long time was the number three producer. Colombia has done the best job out of all the coffee countries marketing themselves. Okay? It is very good coffee. I think it's a little over-marketed. They've had really come on tough times for a couple of reasons. They are also, what I'd say, kind of getting in that developing country, developing. They're having trouble producing. But they've had some real, you know, climate issues down there that have really hurt their crops. And all of Central America is going through a problem right now with a disease called Roya. They've had a, a very, last year and the year before, they've had too wet of a spring. So instead of getting good solid dries, there's a, it gets wet, and a spore forms. It dries out, and that's when the spore hatches and goes through. And then, unfortunately, it gets wet again. So it's like a double cycle, and it's just something that's currently going on. They have to spray for it. Uh, they use a surface copper sulfate spray um, that will, and they have to spray the underside of every leaf. Think about that. That small farm of 1,500 acres is a million and a half trees. They've got to spray the underside of all the leaves. It's a, I've seen them doing it, so it's not something I want to do, but anyhow, go ahead. Oh, you, your presentation focused a lot on Costa Rica, and you mentioned La Manita, and I'm interested in what you consider the premium coffees, and I also want to ask you about Kona mm -hmm. coffee in mm -hmm. Hawaii. Sure. Um, I've been to Costa Rica the most number of times. I have a very direct farm relationship there, so I have the most pictures from that. Yeah. That may be what kind of focused me on that. but. Costa Rica is very typical of most of Central American production. Africa and Indonesian, I could go way off on some tangents. Um, in my opinion, I don't want to say any one coffee is better than others, but there are certain countries that are better suited for growing coffee that kind of, they kind of I would say, are, are the top ones that you should try and everybody should try. Sumatra, Indonesian coffees are naturally lower in acidity, heavy syrupy body with some fruity flavors. It's the only one I picked from Indonesia. If you go to Africa, Ethiopia, especially if they do a dry processed coffee, it has a heavy, heavy fruitiness, a higher acidity, and a lighter body. Kenya, everybody knows Kenya, super high acidity, really tart coffee, typically much more refreshing in the summer. The, the, the acidity is a refreshing palate cleanser. Uh, and it can be like ripe blackberries if you really get a good one. Um, in Africa, I'll, I'll stop at that for now. In Central America and, and South America, actually has some of the best. Costa Rica, Guatemala, El Salvador, Colombia are probably my top there. So I got about eight there, seven or eight coffees. Go ahead. Well, larger companies like Chase and Sanborn, um, Starbucks. Have they bought their own farms now to control the production costs? No. <laughs> It'd be a, it's a terrible investment. The commodity business right now is buying farms. Um, I have to come back and answer a question about coming to you. Don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they want much more flexibility than that. The big companies, remember we talked about Arabicas and Robustas. Coffee's a commodity. It shoots up and down. It's, it's really riding up right now for no real good reason that anybody knows, but it's really bounced up about 20 cents a pound in the last couple of weeks. 
it hasn't been passed on, but it, it's there. Um, they buy, and what they'll do is they'll substitute their blend based on values. Their Arabica to Robusto percentage will adjust based on cost. Robusto is always less expensive. So if the market's in a favorable position for them to add and increase the quality, they'll buy the Arabicas. If the price of the Arabicas is going up, they'll retreat and add a little more Robusto to keep their price a little more consistent. And they also buy over different quality grades. Remember, every coffee, that first grade, second grade, third grade, has to be sold. Has to go somewhere because they pay you pay to produce them, so you have to sell every scrap. Now the third qualities, I often refer to them as chicken copies because you'll see chickens strolling through them on the farms. They're stuck to the side. <laughs> They'll sell that for local consumption. That's why when you go to Costa Rica or you go to Central America, you usually get the worst coffee. <laughs> they sell all the good stuff because they need the money. Okay, we're talking about Rwanda. Eighty percent of their foreign exchange money they get comes from coffee. They don't want to keep any of the good stuff. They're going to sell every dime that they can. Um, there are roasters in Costa Rica. Like I said, I know Costa Rica the best. I've been there the most times. They actually pour sugar into the roaster to sweeten up the coffee. And roast it right onto the beef. Uh, your question about Kona. Oh, yeah. Kona is an excellent coffee. It's so it's, expensive. Well, that's because of American right. salary rates okay. and American property values. They've got to pay minimum wages that are you know, unlike what they pay in, in these other countries. Um, is that right or wrong? I, I don't know. Mostly coffee nowadays is pretty well exceeds the, the old fair trade things. When the market was in a real slump, when it was down 60 cents, fair trade got very popular. Uh, I think it's a great ideal. I, I don't think the system worked great. There's some better systems that have come along since fair trade. But um, I think they had the right idea. But the market's moved up past that. So the kind of fair trade has lost a lot of its significance. I still I sell fair trade. I still believe in it. The other one that we're bringing on is something called rainforest. I like rainforest, and I'll tell you why. It has a little bit three prong approach. Not only does it only have the financial minimum salary, minimum you know worker living the part that fair trade does, it also has an ecological standpoint. They inspect your farm. You have to have a buffer zone between any waters and any any uh, cultivated land. So there's a buffer zone. You have to, you know, you get points towards your score for a dead tree and a live tree and, you know, all kinds of things they do. And then they also have some sociological things. They want to make sure that worker housing is in good shape. So to me, it's a better balance uh, uh, in an imperfect world. You have to remember that, you know, a lot of time ago they talked about child labor. These pickers are in a strange place. They don't want to drop their kids off at some preschool that they don't know. They'd rather have the kids playing with them in the field. And if they pick a little and throw it in, nobody cares. But that, that's perceived as child labor, and it really, in most cases, is cultural. They want their kids with them. They want their family with them. They'll have a the family dog with them, too, you know. So it, there is a little cultural to it. Go ahead, sir, uh, and I'll come back to you. I there's see. probably no absolute answer to this, but in your opinion, generally speaking, what's the best roast for best flavor? Mm -hmm. Medium, dark, dark? The, 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 the term I like is called full city or full flavor roast. As you roast coffee, there's two distinct cracks in the bean, pre the second crack. And then in there, it varies based on the coffee. Now, I enjoy a good French roast once in a while. I don't like French roast for breakfast. That's one I like in the afternoon. So you don't, if you roast it too dark, and remember what that, that seed was. It was a seed. It was loaded with fructose as the energy to develop that first root and those first two leaves. That's sugar. When you're roasting coffee, you're actually caramelizing the sugar. That's how you get from a green bean to a brown bean. If you over roast it and you keep roasting it, what happens to the bottom of the pan? All that sugar would turn to carbon. And once you're in a French roast, you're starting to taste carbon. And carbon tastes like carbon tastes like carbon. You're not even tasting the coffee. The reason that a lot of places do that and have a history of doing it, and that New Orleans added chicory for all those years, is because the coffee was not good. Uh, the last place, I don't like to buy coffee that was stored in New Orleans. Humidity is too high. It affects the coffee. If it comes through New Orleans, it's okay, but I, don't, I want to find out. I don't want to make sure it wasn't stored there for any period of time. You know, the Pacific Northwest started that same dark thing, Starbucks. I mean, Pete's in Berkeley is even more, I mean, even darker. You know, and we have Pete's now around here. They took over the old caribou. 
it's even darker. It was a taste that was developed because of, and I don't want to say there's bad beans now, but at that time, you couldn't necessarily get good beans because you got what you got. And it was wooden sailing ships, it wasn't container shipping. It took a lot longer for coffee to get here, especially from Indonesia or something. You said uh, when you roast your coffee, after eight days, you get rid of it if you don't haven't served it? Right. Do you find that if you, after you roast, if you give the coffee, say, a four-day degassing period, it improves after that? At four least days 24 days hours. At least 24 time. hours. Espresso, we like three or four days. It makes a big difference with espresso. With regular coffee, we like 24 hours. Okay. okay? So uh, that's, you know, a day or two is not a bad thing. When we do sample roasting, we roast today, we don't cup till tomorrow. It won't taste right today. Do you ever do cuppings for customers? We keep talking about it. We have the facility to do it. We've never really done it. I do it for wholesale customers. I haven't done it for the general public yet. And I would like to. I, it's something you will see happen. Go ahead, Nick. Well, uh, when somebody wants to make their own coffee, uh, do you buy several species together? And how do you, how do you make coffee? <laughs> well, what we typically sell is mostly what we call single varietal coffee, okay? So we're talking about species of plants before. There's many subcultivars, you know, Katwai, yellow cat, you saw the yellow Katwai, there's a red Katwai, there's a Katimor, there's a Bourbon, everybody's heard the word Bourbon. There's all these subcultivars. Most farms, those are somewhat mixed in some, uh, in some fashion based on more than likely what the coffee association in that country gave away is these are the seedlings we think work well here. Okay? And they change from time to time. There's been ones that have failed. Companies, farms say they don't taste as good as they're supposed to pull out the trees, put something else in, whatever. But, we, but coffee is all really very, very closely genetically tied. The differences are very, very minor. What really affects the coffee of a bean, the flavor of coffee bean, is climate and terroir. Okay? So I've had coffees from the same farm on the sun side and on the shade side. Same coffee mix of trees. Everything's the same. They'll taste different. Okay? So it's terroir. What is the soil contributing to it? Um, an important thing is, and this is a problem with organics, so I'll touch on organics a little bit. I, have, I think organics are a great thing. Coffee is a very difficult problem with organics. The thing is, is that coffee is from one place. And now we've moved into a bunch of places it's not natural from. Well, that means that the soil isn't quite right for it. Coffees draw nitrogen out of the soil. That's its heaviest damage, let's say it does the soil. So if you want to keep a coffee farm going, you need to put nitrogen back in. You can try and do it organically. It's very difficult. Um, one of the farms we deal with, they maintain uh, a couple hundred acres of natural woodlands. They test that soil. Instead of trying to correct their soil to be what the coffee tree wants, they correct their soil to what's natural. So it, it's very unique to that area and it tastes like it should for that area. The same tree would taste somewhere different on a different farm. The exact same seed. Go ahead, Helen, in the background. I've got another one here. Go ahead. Okay, uh, two, two quick two questions. First of all, uh, when you go to your coffee shop, you since I can only drink decaf because caffeine bothers me. Sure. But um, how many of these coffees flavors do you offer at one time? Is it based on what's available? Mm -hmm. we, we, yeah, we, we have some standards that we keep all year, essentially. Okay. Then we have what we call guest coffees. And I may buy five green bags, or I may buy ten, or I may buy twenty, and they'll come and they'll go. Okay. And so they're usually on a separate board, actually, in my stores, anyhow. So here's a, you know, it's a, offer, a roaster's offering of something different. We have a really nice Peru coming on. I went to Peru last June, and I bought a coffee while I was there, and I got like 20 or 30 bags of it. I don't know. So it'll be on for a couple months. But I may only buy 10 of something else. It'll only be on for a month. Okay. okay. And these? And we decaf? Uh, well, that, but also, I just was curious what... Uh, the fruit and the byproducts of all that washing, what happens to that? I was um, the most countries now have very strict water laws. Um, that, the big thing is the use of the water. And you can't just dump the water back into a stream 
it would just ruin the string. What they now, excuse me, the fruit itself usually goes into a natural composting. And they'll, when I said they dig that four foot hole, that's what's down at the bottom of that hole. Some fruit, some lye, you know, to help it break down, uh, maybe some, a little bit of a fertilizer, a natural fertilizer, etc., and natural compost. Um, and when they trim trees, they don't take anything out. They let it fall right back in. They want whatever came out of the soil to try and go right back in. Okay. Also, by doing that, it actually helps keep the weeds down by the by having a natural, you know, kind of like putting mulch works kind of the same way. The natural mulch. Um, <coughs> so, well, what was the other part of your question? Uh, the decaf. Oh, the decaf. Um, very interesting thing. I get questioned a lot about decaf. We made it. We made a decision about decaf. There are really about two or three major methods of decaffeination. Chemical decaf, which is uh, a high a solvent called methylene chloride. They soak the beans in water and the beans swell up. It actually opens the pores. Then they run it through methylene chloride. Caffeine is very, very highly water soluble. Methylene chloride even more so. Sucks the caffeine right out. Then they rinse it again and they dry it out. And it can be average decafs for like Maxwell, something like that, or 92% caffeine free. Um, the caffeine is actually recovered and usually sold as pharmaceutical grade caffeine, goes in, etc. Pepsi, whatever. Um, there's also the natural water methods uh, Swiss water and CO2 sparkling water. They use water and then rinse with water rather than chemical. They take a little bit longer. They're done under, you know, it seems like a very simple thing, but it isn't. It's done under extremely high pressure. But there's no chemicals mixed in. I, in all these years of doing this, I've never seen a report that says there's any chemical left in a bean for decaf. But you know what? I just decided I didn't want to mess with that. We only sell water decafs. So we don't have to answer the question. So uh, I've never seen any report that really says it's bad other than people say it can't be good. Is it did the water methods take out as much caffeine? They actually, they, they will be rated, the ones we purchase are rated at 99.9% .9 caffeine free. I will say methylene chloride, MC method, uh, tastes a little bit better. But uh, a fresh roasted decaf, even Swiss water, is far better than most that you buy in here. So it's a little bit of a trade. We just avoid it. Go ahead, sir, and I'll come back. Clarify chicory. How do you, how does this get into the act? Well, like I said, in the old days, the coffee didn't have very good flavor in New Orleans. Uh, it's very high humidity. It would come in and be stored, it would sweat in the high humidity, and it just loses flavor, it was stale. So to add flavor, they added chicory, which is very, very bitter. Yeah. And they, they were adding that as a component of coffee. I actually like it yeah. in small doses. You add what? How much? I've never done it. I've only drank it. I've drank it at Cafe Du Monde like everybody else with the bananas, you know? And the other question I have, someone comes in and wants a strong cup of coffee. Uh-huh. What's that mean? Or can you do, I mean, you don't have a weak coffee. Right? right. Well, we we serve a light and a heavy coffee. Mm -hmm. So we always have three coffees on our board. A light, a heavy. Now, a heavy could be a French roast. It could be just a coffee we consider to have heavy body relative to the other coffee. And we always serve a decaf. So ask for the heavier body one of them. Okay? That's now, we probably brew coffee much, uh, not probably, I know that we would put much more coffee per water than any other place around. Uh, that's not a special, especially like Eaton Park or whatever. They, they brew a fairly mild cup of coffee, very little coffee to water relative to what we do. So I think, you know, and I recommend everybody to try and drink coffee black if you can. Don't add too much sugar milk if you get away. You had a question, sir? After your beans pass uh, the eight days from roasting, what do you do with them? If our manager's doing his job right, he's used them in COD, coffee of the day. That's where the final, usually we use them up by brewing them within that eight day. And if you have the floors, what do you do with them? Oh, we'll give them away sometimes. Uh, the employees, mostly food employees. Food pantries or? The food pantries don't really want them because they don't, they're not ground packets of coffee. We've never had luck with that. Having somebody take them because they don't want to deal with whole bean coffee. Do you sell it fertilizer? No, but we give people grounds regularly for that sort of thing. The other thing we give away is the there's a silver skin when you roast. That's most like a, a red skin on a peanut when you fresh shell peanuts. Mm -hmm. uh, we give that to uh, <coughs> Destiny Farms, 
It's a lilac farm down in Washington County. They use it in their soil. It's a great thing. Mm -hmm. You got to be careful if you throw it. Um, you got to wet it down, or else it'll blow in your neighbor's yard in two seconds. It just it takes off. Um, coffee grounds are great stuff too. If you ever want it, one of our stores can collect some for you. Don't use it inside. It attracts food fries inside for some reason. So it's an outside thing. Do you use any robusta at all? No. No. Not in the uh, espresso right now. No. In, in espresso, it's used by a lot of people. It has a very high fat content, so it helps the crema, that foam on espresso. But if you're doing really fresh like we are in eight days, you don't need it anyhow. It doesn't make a difference. And it just adds off flavors. I did do a Robusta cup in a couple of years back. It was terrible. Yeah. It was all Indian coffee. It was terrible. I'm sorry, I have a question right back here, and then I'll come back. Yeah, a uh, moving question. Uh, what, uh, what impact does water temperature have on the Flavor and the Biggest problem with the cheap home machines is they don't make the water hot enough. Doesn't get hot enough, doesn't dissolve the things you want to dissolve out of the coffee. So you need, you want that 200 degrees more. So there are several brewers out there that are that. They're of course always more expensive than Mr. Coffee's, etc. That's why the easiest way to brew at home is a French press. Because you're pouring barley water right off the thing. There's nothing to mess with the flavor. You plunge it at four minutes. Drink it up. If you want another one, make another one. That's the best, like, the best, the best. It also is the nice thing with the filter comes now, the Chemex is. I mean, my grandmother, my father says my grandmother started with the Chemex and then she went to a percolator when they started, when they got popular, because she liked it hot. The problem with the percolator is it runs coffee over coffee, so it always has a, it over extracts and it tends to have a bitter flavor. The Chemex is a great way to make coffee too. I use Molita and just pour boiling water. Yeah. That's the, there are some tricks to it. Uh, you want to pour it steady, and a lot of stores like mine, we sell these kind of fancy goosenecks pots. So you can put a nice, slow, steady stream and do that. That does make a difference if you try it. You don't want to hit the paper edge because the water is lazy. It goes through the quickest way possible. So if you hit the edge, it's going right through the paper. It's not touching the coffee. pre winch your filter, your paper filter, so you get rid of any loose paper taste that may be in it. But that also preheats. If you're using a ceramic molina, it'll preheat that and keep everything a little bit hotter. And then just pour it down and then keep it within a certain amount of time. What do you think of the arrow press? Love it. I think it's a cool piece of a cool, cool thing. Uh, an arrow press is actually made by Aerobi, the same guys who make the Aerobi Frisbee discs. And it's a little, make your own little press pot of coffee. It's cheap, it's plastic, it doesn't break, you can travel with it real easy. I love it. And it makes a really good cup of coffee. You can use it to kind of make a concentrate and then add more hot water. It's great. What is it in here? It's called a, it's called an aero press. We sell them in our stores. Most stores sell them these days. Um, but it's a it's a plunger method where you put the coffee in, you set it right over your mug, put the coffee in, you put the water in, and when you're ready, you plunge it. So it makes kind of a concentrate because it's under pressure. Really extracts well. And then you want to maybe mix it with water. They they talk about the way to make espresso with it. Which I'm like, eh, okay, but the, the, the adding water to it to make a cup of coffee, I think is very, very good. Very quality cup of coffee for doing it that way at home. Go ahead. You talked about Vietnam being the second largest producer of coffee. Do you carry any of that? No, it's all Robusta. It's all Robusta. <laughs> Vietnam's surge into the coffee industry is what caused the glut and the low prices of 10 years ago. Well, I had coffee in Vietnam was pretty well going to quit. I don't know if it was all the bus, though. But, uh, well, know, I hear they're doing some Arabicas, but I've never had one that was any good. Maybe that's what they Maybe it'll come to me at some point, but I've never had one. I've a friend there, and I was bringing me a pile of back in a week or so. It'll be interesting, interesting to see how that tastes. It'll be interesting. You talk about the turnover of inventory. Uh, any comments on your competitors in the city of Pittsburgh? Uh, you know, um, I, I don't really, you know, if you've got Starbucks and things they do, they, they use a lot of packaging to extend their life. You know, they roast in New York PA for this market and ship. They use a lot of nitrogen filled, very fancy bags and all that. Um, that's how they prevent staling. Okay. Um, their retail bags are packaged there and you buy it. It's not packaged in the store. Um, you know, there are other guys here that are fresh roasters. There are other guys here that are not fresh roasters. You know, uh, TJ from Commonplace Coffee is a competitor across the street. I knew him before he was, when he had just started, and he and I are still friendly. We still exchange emails just the other day. 
we do things a little bit differently, but we're all on the same same tack. But what I think is the right coffee may not be what he thinks is the right taste of that coffee. We have different preferences and different roasting styles, quite honestly. Um, a few decades ago, a friend of mine in Colombia told me that the people who own the plantations would have their help go out and pick up beans that had been through the digestive system of birds, and those were what they would use for their own coffee. Was okay. that true? This is what's called, you'll hear about it on TV every once in a while, Kopi Lala. Remember from Bucket List, that coffee that yeah. once his name was drinking? Yeah. This relates to that, and there's a couple different types of this. Um, Kopi Lala is the most famous one, and the bird coffee is similar. These animals eat the cherry, digest essentially the skin and the fruit off, and then pass the seed through, and then they would gather it and then roast it. Uh, I don't want to be improper, but I have a very good friend who's very, very distinguished in the coffee industry, and he says it's coffee from assholes for assholes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he described it. You know, it's been described to me as very earthy. I can only imagine. I have no interest. Uh, I just have no interest. So. Sorry about that. Yeah. Good reason. Yes? I'm changing the subject sure. slightly. Uh, um, you have wonderful help in your stores. Where do you find such terrific people? You know, we interview based on personality and not based on experience. Mm -hmm. We try to find nice people. I'd like to say everybody's perfect. Not everybody's perfect. Yeah. But mm -hmm. we work at it. Uh, we do. We have been very lucky over our history. At one point, though, I remember my dad and I were keeping score who was the better interviewer with how the employees turned out. In the end, we kept score because both of us were pretty terrible. You, know? <laughs> uh, you, you just try and hire nice people. And you want people, in our opinions, that have other activities. I'd rather have somebody with a tough schedule because they're busy. They're a more rounded person. They're studying, whatever. Uh, we allow, we're very flexible on schedule changes and things like that because we think good, happy employees have happy lives outside. You know, they're not, they're not, 99% of our employees go on to bigger and better things. They're in college. They're just with us for a while. We wish them well at the door. There's a few we got to kick out the door. We get to fire. But, you know, most of them we know. We did them, hire my daughter. Didn't we? Yeah, my oldest daughter, remember? Did you say hire or fire? No, hire. I was going to say, I don't remember hiring. I hired. Hire. You, you hire. hired. You, you hit over for you. Yeah, for about a year. Yeah. Almost a year. Yeah. I mean, we've hired a lot over the years that the parents are raised. I had to fire, anybody know Will Carpenter? Yep. Contractor? I had to fire his stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. I had to call him and say, I'm sorry, she's not ready to work. He's there every day. He is. He's still, he's still my contractor. He's still a good customer. <laughs> he and I chatted about that. He said, yeah. He said, yeah. But I just had to grab the, you know, it was just the right decision at the time. Go ahead. Yeah. Come on. I, I used to point to me sure. you. Sure. Uh, you made me see how much more uh, involved coffee is. If I would come to your store and say, I want a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. would you know what I want? Well, I, I, listen, I would suggest... Do I have to explain a little I, I, bit more? You know, I would suggest... I mean, we didn't even talk about espresso. We really only talked about drip coffee. There's a whole other world of espresso and those sort of things. But I, I would just suggest that you ask for the light coffee of the day. The, the lighter coffee of the day. The so on our board, there'll be three CODs or coffee of the day. The light one, the main <laughs> one, and the decaf. Try the light one. Okay? Taste it black and then decide if you need to add sugar or cream or half and half or milk or whatever you would like. But try it black. That's all I have. Helen, you got I know you sort of touched on this, but you have, your, your coffee now is roasted in a facility in you were saying in West, West Memphis. Memphis. So it the old Continental to... Can Building Pardon? is actually where we are. Mm. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. The old Continental Can Building? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. That building is all subdivided with uh, different industrial tenants like us. <laughs> so that's where we have about 24,000 square feet we roast. Uh, we also, you know, so our, our cup, you know, we have six stores. Our cups come in there, all the big bulk items come in there by truck, and then we deliver out to the six stores. And, we also have wholesale business that we deliver to as well mm -hmm. around the city. I think I saw something back there. Maybe? No? Okay.
Oh. I like uh, hazelnut coffee. Sure. Talk about flavors. Um, we do, only some of our stores do we still do flavored coffees in. The, the issue for us is that um, we just don't sell that many of them. They, you know, when the, the whole specialty coffee really got started, uh, that was considered specialty coffee. Gloria Jean's at the mall in that store, that, you know, they're very artificial, so I kind of shy away from them. Uh, we do, when people want flavoring, a lot of times now we add the shots of syrup uh, because we don't have to try and do a whole batch, etc. Um, so you can get almost anything we have in flavor syrup. The syrup flavors are typically meant for uh, lattes, etc. They mix well with milk. But even flavored coffees like your hazelnut, your vanilla, nut crunch, whatever those things are, they're designed to be drank with sugar and cream. The sugar is an enhancer, and the milk is sort of like a sticker. They, uh, they have a word for it, but the milk, you know, milk coats your tongue, and then the hazelnut flavor, the artificial hazelnut flavor, stick to the milk and sticks to your tongue, so it tastes better. We've gotten away from it because we just don't emphasize it. It's not really what we do. Um, Margaret's and Squirrel Hill does a very nice section of, of many more flavored coffees than we do. Uh, we tend to stick to the straight variety as a fresh roast. Though we do do some of it. I, I don't even remember which stores still do it. We've got I mean, just some of them just kind of quit selling for us over the years. So. Okay. Well, Question? No. Thank you. Very no, much. No, thank you.